Father, we come before you and before your word in faith. We know from the natural standpoint, our inabilities and inefficiencies, but your word states in the Bible, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And we praise you. We trust the greater one. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. We put our trust in this greater one who lives within us. And Lord, I boldly declare that he will live big in me this morning. That he will unveil the word of God to all of us this morning. He will unveil and give us revelation and insight and ideas from heaven, from your word. And I boldly declare he will enable me to stand in the office under which he has called me and fulfill the call of God in my life. And we are quick to give all the glory for every word that's said and every deed that's done to the worthy and majestic, wonderful name of the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, our Healer, and our High Priest. And we thank you for it. Oh, Lord, we just pray. Let's just lift our hands and pray. Just, just worship the Lord. Just praise him for a few moments. We just praise you and worship you. We praise you and worship you, Father. We praise and magnify your name. You know, King David used a word in the and, and, and talking about the temple, uh, excuse me, yeah, the temple, the temple of God that they were planning and, and building. He used a word that it, it is thrilling to me. And there's sometimes there's just nothing else will do. He said, God's house must be magnificent. Don't you like that? <laughs> yeah. And this morning, he is just magnificent to me this morning. I'm bigger on the inside than I am on the outside. Glory to God. I am so, so thrilled with the, the things that have been manifesting in our lives and in our ministry here of late at EMIC there in Fort Worth. My goodness, the power of God hit us in late latter part of 2014 and, and it just continues to build and just continues, particularly the healing power of God, but also the, the, the ministry and, and the anointing of increase has, has come again in, in magnifical <laughs> ways. Amen. That word just kind of fits me this morning. Amen. <laughs> Say it, magnificent. <laughs> Comes out good, doesn't it? <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. And uh, it's, it's really going on down there and it's happening in, in my life personally and in Gloria's life personally. Uh, I've had, uh, I, I really don't know how to express it to you. 
this coming January will be our, uh, our 50th anniversary in the ministry. And, uh, you know, we've, we've enjoyed it. We've enjoyed a lot of wonderful, marvelous things. But several months ago, I was there at, at, at home. Gloria was out. And uh, I was just worshiping the Lord there at the house and, and took communion. And God filled the place. Began to minister to me. He said, I want you to go back to total immersion like you did nearly 50 years ago when you first got into the well, when Gloria and I first got into the Word of God, we were, I was a student there at Oral Roberts University and, and um, we had, uh, and, and while we were there, we were introduced to Brother Hagin's ministry, Brother Kenneth Hagin's ministry. And so I was privileged, as most of you know, um, to become part of the, uh, of Brother Roberts' flight crew, and it dawned on me a few days later, Oral Roberts can't get out of town without me. <laughs> Took my lightning fast mind about two days to figure that out. <laughs> I was still kind of shocked over this whole thing. And, uh, but here, it, it was amazing the way God arranged that because I'm, I have a front row seat in the Oral Roberts campaigns. I'm watching and experiencing miracles of the like I've, I've, I've seen a few over the years that matched the ones that I saw there. But the second meeting we were out, they assigned me to minister in the invalid room. Well, in those large crowds, and, and you have to remember, Brother Roberts would, would be seated up on the platform and people would walk by and he laid hands on a lot of people. Well, there were people that were ambulatory and just all different kinds of things where it's very difficult for them to manage that out there in that crowd of people. Now, there were people that were uh, even in, even on st uh, stretchers and that kind of thing that did come up there, but there's, there was some very, there, there, were, there were people, one I'm gonna tell you about right now was, uh, she was in the, the last hours of cancer. And bless her heart, I, I don't think she could have weighed over 75 pounds. Well, she doesn't need to be out there in, in all that crowd. Anyway, there would, they, they had a room set aside for that. And then uh, my boss in, on, on the field when we were in those meetings, came and got me. He said, now you go in there in that invalid room and you listen on the, on the sound system at, at his message and outline it. And then he said, between the time that he gives the invitation to the lost and he goes back out there then to minister to the sick, you're going to have from five to seven minutes there because he's going to come back and lay hands on these people first. So you take that time and, and you remind them of what he said and, and prepare them to have hands laid on them. 
So this, and this was my first day in there. So I had done that and, uh, and I had gone over the, the points of his message and so forth. And when he walked in, of course, I had stepped back and he, he walked up and, and kind of surveyed the room. And he reached over and got me by the coat, pulled me over there to him. He said, now, you're going to do the praying and you're going to do the laying on of hands. Really? I'd never done anything like that. You know, I mean, I'm green as a gourd, brother. <laughs> I'd never, particularly in this kind of a situation. And I, I know I was changing colors. I could feel it, you know. <laughs> and he said, he laughed at me. He said, don't worry about it. He said, if you make a mistake, I'll fix it. I'll be standing right there. Well, that, that made me feel better. But then, but then he said, don't touch them till you're ready to release your faith. Well, I'd never heard that. And uh, we had a, about three or four steps to the first person. And it was that little woman that I was telling you about. Had a cancer, a malignant tumor of the stomach. And he just started for her. Well, I've been sitting in there for over an hour watching her. And she, I'm telling you, you never saw anybody as close to being dead in your life. And we headed right straight for her. And he said, don't touch her until you're ready to release your faith. Well, I'd been studying on the power and authority of the name of Jesus. I, I was d deeply into a, a, a study about that. And... Uh, and, and I just, it just came up on the inside of me that, that that's going to be my point of contact, that I'm going to touch them the moment I speak the name of Jesus. Now, you remember what Peter and John did at the beautiful gate? And then Peter talked when they, that crippled man was raised up. And then he said, not by our holiness, or I calling and made this man strong, but faith in the name of Jesus raised him up. And so that, that was going on in the inside of me. Well, I, we walked over there and I said, in the name of G, and that's as far as I got. Now I had touched her just as I was saying the name of Jesus. He was standing right behind me a little over to the side. The only thing that I could think of was the line of the tribe of Judah has roared. I've experienced this about four times in the, the years that I've been in the ministry. And, uh, and I experienced it that night with with him. And I experienced it one time uh, other than that from someone else. In fact, one of the, one of the smallest women I've ever seen, little, little small Navajo Indian woman, little Navajo prayer warrior. I mean, she shouted the name of Jesus one night in a meeting I was in, and I want you to know every hair on your body stands straight up. You, you, and you, 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 can't, you can't even, um, you can't even touch that just naturally trying to re redo it or without that anointing. It, it is, uh, it, it is, an anointing of healing power in words. Jesus at the tomb of Lazarus shouted with a loud voice. And it's that, that, that kind of thing. And it's the voice of God. You can't imitate it. Yes. And that's what happened. You fire 
unclean spirit. In the name of Jesus, whose I am and whom I serve. Take your hands off of God's property now. Amen. Oh man, I mean, it just, it just sucked all the air out of the room. She and spit that tumor up out on the floor. Jumped up and shouted, my God, I'm healed. Now she had been so weak when we walked up there, her nurse had to put her hands behind her back. She was laying on a, a, a military kind of a cot. And she couldn't lift herself up and kind of get her up on her side for us to lay hands on her. She blasted off of that cot shouting, I'm healed, and took off around that room just to run it. Her nurse right behind her thinking she's going to die any second. Totally healed. Well, of course she was. The tumor's laying there on the ground. Now, I'm, I'm a part of all that. And at the same time, I'm totally immersed. We didn't, we didn't turn a television on for oh, over a year. I didn't have time for that. And here I am listening to Brother Hagin's tapes, this one right after another on faith and how it works. And I'm on the road watching it work. Amen. Praise Amen. Hallelujah. Praise and the Lord was saying to me, you go back to total immersion. I went through the house, took authority over that TV demon <laughs> that's sucking my time. Deprogrammed a DVR. Got rid of all that trash. Amen. Amen. <laughs> and started listening to Brother Hagin's tapes again. Glory to God. Yeah. And, and, and the Lord just uh, made an arrangement for me. It's just to show you, I mean, it, uh, he, he had me go back. He said, now I want you to go back to the ABCs of faith. He said, you've been teaching faith from where you are now. And he said, you've got millions and millions of people now coming in that have never even heard this, particularly over the, over the BBOB network and, 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 and all of these different ways that the word's getting out now. And he said, you, they, they don't even know what you're talking about. So go back. Well, I had to go back and restudy it again from, from the very beginning and I'm looking for material. And of course, they, I ordered some things from, uh, from uh, uh, Ken Jr. in and, and Tulsa, uh, and, uh, who is, is now, of course, over all Kenneth Hagin Ministries. Brother Hagin went, went to heaven in 2003. Well, there was a man that, I, and I know him, I, I, not acquainted with him all that well. But then uh, Dr. David Weeder, who is part of our team and has been uh, part of this team for many years. And his son now is 17 and, and, and he's, been, he's been in ministry all of his life. He never known anything else. He told him that that's what he's going to be when, when he wasn't old enough to talk. And he, he just, he, he just spends his time developing his ministry. He is so, well, this friend of mine sent him a link and it had almost everything Brother Hagin ever preached. I mean, there was messages that went all the way back to 1965. Well, I didn't come in until 67 and there they all were. I'm like a kid in a candy store. I'm telling you from 65 to 2003 when Brother Hagin went on with the Lord. Wow. Marvelous. 
But let me tell you what was so delicious to me. July the 30th, 1977, camp meeting in Tulsa. I had taught uh, the morning sessions all week. And this was Saturday night. This was the last service. And uh, they had chairs up on the platform there. And the speakers were, were up there on the platform. Gloria and I was sitting there right, right in the middle. And Brother Hagin had already, I mean, the, he'd already preached his message. And the funny part of it was, he said, uh, now he said this afternoon while I was preparing, he said, I had something else in mind, but he said, I just kept hearing the bones of Elisha, the bones of Elisha, bones of Elisha. And he said, well, I'm sitting up here on the platform. He said, I just kept hearing bones of Elisha. And he said, okay, I don't know what I'm going to say about the bones of Elisha, but here it goes. <laughs> anyway, you remember what happened with the bones of Elisha. I mean, they, Elisha had been, uh, He'd been dead for a number of years. And they were, they were bringing this young man out to bury him. And the burial detail got out there and suddenly there's an enemy patrol started coming over the hill. Oh, man, I mean, they gave up that dead guy right quick and just <laughs> chunked him in Elisha's sepulcher. Yeah. <laughs> and the moment he touched his bones, there was enough anointing in those bones to raise him from the dead did and he stood up. Well, of course there's healing there too. Cause if it hadn't, if he hadn't been healed, he'd have died from whatever he died of before. <laughs> so he's preaching on the bones of Elisha. Well, the whole message turned out to be about the prophet's ministry. And he began to talk about personal things that I'd, I'd heard him talk about that some back then. then. And, uh, but here was this whole message on the prophet's message. And he had come to the end of the message and he's praying over the invitation. And in the middle of that, the Lord began to talk to him. And he said, uh, yes, Lord, yeah, yeah, I understand that. Oh Lord, he said, I, I'm, I repent of that. He said, I, I with your help, I, I'll, I, I'll do better than that. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. Yeah, I understand that. Yeah. Huh, yeah, yeah. I said, yeah, yeah. I'll tell him, Ken Copeland. <laughs> Now you're going to have to get on over there in that healing ministry a little sooner than you thought because the time is short. There was a time where you could uh, get ready for some things, but Jesus is coming. Oh yeah, Lord. Yeah, I, yeah, I know that Lord. I'll tell him. I'll tell him. And whether you want to or not, you're going to minister in the office of the prophet, the seer seer standing right in the pulpit. You'll see right before your eyes, it'll roll off like on a TV screen and you'll be able to minister to the people. Well, now he had talked about that during that message. <laughs> now, now this is in, in a couple of months, this will be 39 years ago. You understand? Yeah. And then he laid hands on me and, and he said, uh, by the authority invested in me as a prophet of God, by the direction of the head of the church, the Lord Jesus Christ, I separate you under the office of the prophet to which he has called. And by faith, we impart unto you the gifts, the spirit, the anointing, the endowments, the endowment, and all the gifts necessary to equip you to stand in that office. And then he went ahead to say some other things about the, the growth of the ministry and, and so forth. <laughs> a 
about three weeks ago now. I found that service and all of that whole list of messages of his. And I heard it again. Now I've been, I've been carrying um, a transcript of it, you know, but, and, and here was the funny thing. Um, I, I, I carried it for, for a long time, but then I put it in the, in, uh, uh, um, a, a book that I carry of different words of the Lord that have come over the years that are, that are uh, strong and, and uh, specifically, you know, have effect on this ministry and on me and on glory. And it's quite a large book. Well, several months ago, the Lord had me go get that back out and go through that whole book of things that he had, he had said to me and said to glory and said to this ministry over the years, words of the Lord that had come to me, words that had come through Brother Hagin, words that had come through, through others that, that uh, are significant in our lives. So I went back, glory and I, we, we went through and we, <laughs> we're finding all these different things and we're standing on the word and we're believing we receive them. And, and we saw things in there with a the, oh dear God, I let that slip and just repent. And you know, and, and what's, what's the Lord saying? He said, go back to your beginnings, get all these things again, fill your heart with these words. What happens? Faith comes. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so we're doing that. Well, I, I, I made a fresh copy of that and put it in, in, my, little, in my little book here. And uh, I started carrying it and reading it. I, I started reading it again. Just take it out and, and read it and read it and read it and read it and then go back and read it again. And then here, a few weeks ago, I heard it again. Oh, can you see something's happening there? You want me to tell you what it is? For additional CDs, but can, no, 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 I'll tell you. <laughs> I'm not going to leave you. I'm not going to leave you hanging up. <laughs> the Lord began to talk to me ab about those words and I started listening to it just night and day over and over and over. And as, as always, when a, when a word like that, you, the same thing will happen in scripture. God will give you a scripture and you've been maybe been standing on it in years, but for years, but then you go back and you start reading it and then you begin to see things in there you didn't see before. And, and you start hearing, then the Lord start talking to you. Same scripture but it, you, you begin to get an, an in-depth look at it. Well, that's what started happening with this. And I've seen and heard things there. And, and, and then, then the Lord said to me, he said, uh, it's time now for manifestations of the ministry and anointing of the prophet that you haven't walked in up until now. And like a wave coming from way offshore. And you see it way, way, way out offshore, but you can see it. And it's coming. And it's coming. And it gets bigger. And you begin to see it. Oh, this is not an ordinary wave. Oh, I see it. I, I see it. It's not an ordinary wave. Oh my, oh my, what is this Lord? Oh my, oh my, oh Lord God, what is this? What is this? 
This is not just a tidal wave, saith the Lord. This is a, a rolling of my glory. This is an oncoming flood. This is a tsunami of miracles and life beyond anything that anybody's seen on this planet, saith the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. It's already hit in other places in, in the world and it is here now. We are just in those first uh, rising, splashing stages of it. But it's here. I said it's here. Hallelujah. Well, he said it's time for for the next portion of the prophet's office to manifest. <clears throat> and there's some, there's some parts in that that, I, that I've experienced, but, and, and, but, but and you know what I realized when I went back and listened to that on the bones of Elisha? Now, now think about that. God already had this plan. He already had this plan. He, and, and Brother Hagin said, I don't know what I'm going to say about the bones of Elisha. <laughs> the message he preached at night was what I needed to hear right now. He talked about the prophet's ministry the whole way through it. Uh -huh. And I heard him say some things in there that I, and I never caught before concerning the word of knowledge, concerning manifestations of gifts of healings and so forth. <laughs> well, that's not my message. And I, it, it, it's a little bit difficult for me to stay off of it for right now. Maybe, maybe, we'll, maybe the Lord will have us get over it more into that in, in depth later. But I want you, you're partners. You're part of this. You're partakers of my grace. Amen. According to the book of Philippians, the first chapter, you're partakers of my grace. Did you ever notice in there, in the book of Philippians, where he said to them, you are partakers of my grace. That's talking about the anointings on his life. Now in, in Antioch, 13th chapter of Acts, names five men starting with Barnabas and ending with Saul. And as their prophets and teach or teach prophets and teachers or prophets or teachers. And you can, you know, you study the book of Acts and you, you can see that Barnabas was a teacher and, the, and uh, Saul or Paul was a prophet and teacher. But then in the 14th, they, the, the, the Holy Ghost spoke and said, separate unto me Barnabas and Saul for the work that I've called them to. Well, that's what happened to me. The Holy Ghost spoke yes. and Brother Hagin laid hands on me and separated me to the office that God had called me to walk in. Well, then, uh, and then in the 14th chapter of Acts, 14th verse, it says, and the apostles Barnabas and Saul. So Barnabas just as much an apostle as, as Paul. Now this old idea that the apostles ended when, when the original apostles of the Lamb left the earth. Well, <laughs> the only people that can come up with that have never read the New Testament. Paul is an apostle. Barnabas is a, an apostle. If you'll check it out, there's, there's at least 24 of them yes. in the New Testament. And some of them are kind of spooky if you look up and start looking it up in the Greek text. <laughs> I dare you to do it. <laughs> apostle is a sent one. Anyway. <laughs> Hallelujah. Oh, it's hard for me to stay out of that. I, I'd like to dig around in it. Now, <clears throat> thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. 
Thank you, Lord Jesus. He said to them, talking about his grace. Let's go over there. Philippians chapter one. I want you to put your eyes on. Paul and Timothy, the servants of Jesus Christ, Messiah, anointed one, to all the saints in Messiah, anointed one, Jesus, which are at Philippi with the bishops and the deacons. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. Now that's exactly... <laughs> That, is, that I, I'm, I'm saying the same thing to you this morning where my partners are concerned. Glory and I both. I, <laughs> I, when our, our children were coming up when, when they, were, they were young now, and, and I was saying earlier, you know, that we, we raise our own team. Well, we've got 10 grandchildren and, and six great grandchildren and, and uh, we still working. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. But now they, they've all been raised. The, the, the kids, when they were little, they, they thought our partners were, were, were part of our family somewhere. And you are. But we talk about you all the time. Our partners are, are big in this ministry. Everybody in this ministry prays for you every day. Every day. Gloria and I pray for you. You'll never be without prayer from now till Jesus comes. Because uh, Gloria and I have committed to 120 years. I mean, we're seriously committed to it. Amen. Looking forward to it. Now, watch what he said. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you always in every prayer of mine for you all making requests with joy for your fellowship. Now, if you look that up, in the Greek text, that's the old English word for partnership. Back in, 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 during that time, and it's still used this way more in Europe than it is in the United States. But if two people got together to go into business together, they created a fellowship. We, we know it as a partnership. So that uh, for your partnership in the gospel, from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Even as it is meet. Anytime you find M-E-E-T, make a note somewhere around it, A-B-L-E. He has made us able. That happened when you were born again. Colossians chapter one. Even at <clears throat> it is able or I am able to think this of you all because I have you in my heart in as much, now here it is, in my bonds and in the defense and the confirmation of the gospel. Now what is, what is the confirmation of the gospel? They went everywhere, God working with and confirming the word with signs following. Because Jesus had just got through saying, in my name, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature and these signs will follow them that believe. You preach it and the signs will follow you. Amen. They'll lay hands on the sick and they'll recover and so forth. So now he said, you're partakers of my grace. Well, now at this time, he is an apostle. Well, of course, the prophet's anointing is working in him. The teaching anointing is working in him. Glory to God. Now, I want you to, uh, uh, you got your ears on? Yes. All right, I want you to get this now. Verse 20, 
Verse 19, I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and supply of the spirit of Jesus Christ. According to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be life or death. For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. Now, he said, you are partakers of my grace, my anointing as an apostle. Now this is God's method of anointing distribution. This is what, G, this is what he was talking about in Ephesians chapter four. He gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. Now what for? For the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry. How long? Till we come into the unity of the faith to the full stature. Now listen to the word he used. The full stature of Christ. Now wait a minute. Christ is not Jesus' last name. It's a Greek word that was not translated in the English Bible. It should have been, but it, anyway, that neither here nor there, it wasn't. Christ is the Greek translation of the Hebrew word Messiah. Translated into English is anointed or anointed one. Jesus preached everywhere he went, the spirit of the Lord is upon me for he has anointed me to preach. He's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted. He sent me to preach deliverance to the captive. He sent me to preach recovery of sight to the blind. He sent me, huh? To do what? Set at liberty them that are bruised. To set at liberty. How do you do that? You shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. The truth he's preaching. See. But there was one more step to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Now that's supernatural debt cancellation. Yeah, that's right. Hallelujah. See, poverty and debt are under the curse. Yes, sir. Well, he redeemed us yes, from sir. the curse. Yes, yes, right. yes, yes. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Right. Now, I want I want you to I want you to see the flow of that now. You're, you are partakers of the anointing that's on glory in me and on this ministry and our calling because you answered the call of God and, and connected with us in covenant as partners in this ministry. Amen. Now, if you'll expect it, if you'll use your faith for it, the same the same anointings, particularly in the area of healing and finances, will manifest in your life. Yes. Yes. See, you're, you're, you're called, and there's no such thing as a human being called, born into this earth that doesn't have a calling. I mean, and, and then when you get born again, that calling begins to work if you'll let it. Then you get baptized in the Holy Ghost and that grace will begin to develop. And then other graces are added to it as you, as you go. I'm, I'm, oh God. I was thinking about Prince. Now here's a man. See, uh, when I was, when I was little, I thought everybody could sing. I couldn't figure out why they came. And over the years, I thought, well, you know, that's just easy for me to do. That's grace. Yes. And it wasn't given to you to sell a hundred million records. Unless they're gospel records. <laughs> we, we're going to look, we're going to look into these things. But I mean, obviously he didn't know that because I don't, I don't, I don't, I didn't know the man, but I tried to do the same thing. If it hadn't have been for my praying mama, 
I wouldn't even be here today. I'd have something like that very same thing would happen to me because I already had my foot in that door and it is already looking real bad. <laughs> but thank God, mama, I just did my best to go to hell. Mama just wouldn't let me. <laughs> she just stood in the gap. Amen. Well, I'm, I'm saying all this to, to let you see graces there. You may, you may think, well, you know, I, I it just, uh, there's a lot of things that I don't do very well, but I am a good organizer. I just seems like I can do that. And that's just easy for me. No, baby, that's the grace of God. Right. It's graces in your life. Amen. If it is just left up to you, you wouldn't be nothing but a piece of meat. <laughs> like anybody else without the grace of God, there wouldn't even be any grass to grow. Mm -hmm. Amen. But then as you, like I said, as you grow up and particularly when you get born again, then the, and, and especially when you begin to learn that that's what this is and, and then you, you commit and dedicate it to God. I mean, back before I was born again, I didn't get saved until 1962, six months after Gloria and I got married. Well, I mean, mama would, you know, I was like one little boy said he had a drug problem by, by the time he's six years old. And they said, what? He said, yeah, my mama drugged me to church ever. <laughs> well, I had that same drug problem. <laughs> oh, bless her heart. I'm telling you. And mama could sit there with a smile on her face and pinch my little fat leg. I mean, you'd think, boy, oh, that's going to turn the gangrene shorter. Or <laughs> And just, ne you know, that ne never look down. <laughs> you ain't gonna get you home. <laughs> I wear y'all laughing. Some of y'all had the same situation. <laughs> Amen. Well, uh, you know, mama would, particularly later when I was late teens, mid teens, late teens, early twenties. And she wanted me to sing in church or wanted me to sing in, the, in the, their Sunday school class or something. Well, there's no way I'm going to turn her down. I mean, I, you know. <laughs> and so, and that anointing would come on me. And I'd think, why couldn't I do that last night? If I could get this, <laughs> see, cause I, I, I didn't know what it was. Yeah. Well, back there then, you know, we, we was raised in Southern Baptist church and this, this was not something anointing and, and surely not the baptism of the Holy Ghost wasn't even talked about in Baptist circles back there then. In fact, when my mama got, got, and my dad got baptized in the Holy Ghost, like Brother Hagin said, they got the left foot of fellowship from yeah. among the Baptists. <laughs> well, it's now, you know, and that's back in the, that's back in the 1950s, late 50s. Yeah. But, and it's, it's a totally different situation in Amen. most cases yeah. now, thank God. Amen. But the thing I'm pointing out to you is, I want you, I want you to see this. These anointings, you may, you're called in an area, you may be called into the ministry. You may not, you may, you, but everybody has a calling. You may be called to the business world. You may be called in certain areas, but when God calls you to become a partner with a ministry, now you all ought to, you ought to already be partners with your pastor. Come on now. That's first. That's first. The local church is the most powerful thing on, on this earth. Amen. Don't ever forget that. And, but when, when you're partakers of this ministry, these anointings should begin to be manifest in your life. My case in point, I said all that to get to this. Look at the fourth chapter.
Now you Philippians know, 15 first, that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but you only. For even in Thessalonica, hey, that, that's where uh, Jenny's off, our, our orphanage is, Abba House, Thessaloniki now. And there, there, are two, there, there are two twin girls that are uh, daughters of a pastor there that, and they, they, they've just adopted Jenny. And, and these other two girls are, are a little bit younger than Jenny. And Jenny calls them first and second Thessalonians. <laughs> <laughs> and they're just like daughters to me. They're so sweet. For even in Thessalonica, you sent once again to my necessity, not because I desire a gift. Now, now, now get this, not because I desire a gift. I desire that fruit, that's the blessing of the Lord, that fruit may abound to your account. You have an account. It's a heavenly account. but I have all and abound. I am full, having refe- received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. Now notice the 19th verse. He did not say, but God. He did not say your God. He said, my God. On the level of supply and grace of an apostle. My God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory. Now, what is that? What's going on there? Jesus said, if you receive the one whom I send, you receive me. And you receive the one who sent me. He said, when you receive a prophet because he is a prophet, you shall receive a prophet's reward. So on the level of a prophet's ministry, there the reward level of a prophet because you answered that call and you became a covenant partner with with this ministry, then you came up then in that area of a prophet's reward on the same level with glory. Now, since the 1980s, like, like I said, um, or like as some of you saw earlier on the 2015 partner report, since the 1980s there have been 114 million salvations through this ministry and the other ministries that you support through Praise up. God. And the Lord had me pray this from the very beginning, way back when I'm, I was at Oral Roberts University and the Lord started, and I, I got in a partner service with, with uh, Brother Roberts and just set me on fire when I saw this, this covenant relationship. And I went home, I became a partner for $10 a month. We didn't have $10, period. And I, t- I was so excited. I got home and I told Gloria, I said, we're a partner with oil rubbers for $10 a month. Her face fell. She said, where are we going to get $10 a month? We didn't know anything. And I mean, literally, we had zero money. I had put a, a pen. They passed out little envelopes with a pencil you could fill them out with back in those days. And I didn't have anything. And, and so I just, I said, Lord, this represents my $10. And I stuck that pencil in that envelope. 
and I was driving the car and he was already headed out the back. I got to hustle. You understand? <laughs> I got to get out of here, but thank God I'm a partner. And I put my envelope in the, in the offering container and I took about three steps and someone right over here said, Hey, I stopped. Hey, you, Me? yeah, you. Well, you have to understand, uh, I'm in, a, we in the state of Georgia <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> we had the um, meeting down there and she was about two rows back and about three or four rows down. And, and I said, yes, ma'am. She said, the Lord been where what me this whole meeting to give you $10. Now, some, some of y'all don't have no idea what a wear award is. You had children. Remember when they were three and four and five? What's that, daddy? What's this, daddy? How's that work, daddy? Yeah, daddy. What? 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 That's a wear award. <laughs> you got to be from a deep south to know what a wear award is. And I said, I said, whoa, I don't know how to give it here. <laughs> she gave me that $10 and I ran, caught the usher, got my envelope, put my pencil in my pocket and stuffed the $10 in there. And I'm a partner. <laughs> but what I got out of that and, and, Boy, the Lord's been talking to me in this for the, uh, the, the last several weeks about what happened then. And just, just a lot of things. But anyway, I, and I, I took, Gloria said, well, are we ever going to get $10? Mm. Well, she didn't hear the message. Right. I said, sit down, girl. <laughs> and I, I, got my, I got my Bible and I used the same <laughs> scriptures and, and I went through the whole thing and it took me an hour or better. And I went through the whole thing. I said, Gloria, we can have all Robert's anointing for $10 a month. <laughs> Man, her eyes got big. She started shouting. We, you know, when we shouted and danced around the room. And, and I mean, God started doing miracles over that $10 thing. There's just all kinds of things happen. Uh, so, what I wanted you to see from that, begin exercising your faith in the anointing of increase on a prophet's level. The first revelation that Oral Roberts had was not healing. Now, most people think it is, but that came later. He was still pastoring in Enid, Oklahoma. And they didn't even, he and Evelyn went several years. They, they didn't even have a home. Back, back there then, if you were, um, if you were a traveling preacher back in those days, you know, there wasn't anything but a pastor and an evangelist. If you said you was a prophet, they'd run you out of town. And, and I told the Lord, I, I started picking that up that, that the prophet's ministry was coming back in 1968. And, and I, I said, and, and he said that that'll come later. I said, all right, but I'm going to tell you what, I'm not announcing it. I am not announcing this. <laughs> I said, no, I'm leaving this up to you. And when the time comes, you announce it. Cause I don't stand up there and tell anybody that I'm a prophet. Now just, you can forget that. I'm not doing that. And then I, you know, I can almost feel him smiling. He said, yeah, I'll take care of it. Well, I just rolled care of it over him and forgot it. Well, there were 9,000 people there that night. He did it, didn't he? <laughs> he just announced it to everybody. Glory to God. Well, <laughs> back there then, they would go preach in a church and they would stay with the pastor and his wife or one of the deacons and his wife or somebody in the church. And then they would go from there to the next city where they had a meeting. They didn't even have a place to live. They just went from meeting to meeting to meeting to meeting. And then eventually he began to pastor in, in Enid, Oklahoma. Well, they didn't have a parsonage there. They were living with 
one of the deacons in the church. And Evelyn told him, she said, if you don't get a house for me and these children, I'm taking both these kids and I'm going home to my parents. He said, Evelyn, you wouldn't do that. She said, you just try me. <laughs> Boy, she put the pressure on him, see? Well, so he, he, he went to the, the deacon board and said, no, nah, no, nah, nah, you don't need a house. You can live with us. You know, after all, you, you just preacher, you ain't supposed to have nothing anyway. What are you, what are you grabbing about? We feed you. <laughs> just broke. No place to live. Anyway. <laughs> there it was a Wednesday night service. He had just gotten paid that day. $50. No, not for the week. This is something like for the month. And um, he said, we're going to have a parsonage. We need a parsonage. And I'm receiving an offering tonight for this parsonage and I'm, I'm, I'm going to start it and I'm putting this, I'm putting my $50 check in there. And he did. And he said he did it before he thought. He said, if I'd have thought about it, I wouldn't have done it. <laughs> but, but he said, you know, that anointing came on him. Yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> And somebody that you'd heard about passing the hat, well, somebody, they actually did that that night. And, and the, uh, one of the, uh, some, somebody in the congregation took this fellow's hat and passed it around to, for money to, for that parsonage. Well, he said it was cold winter night in Oklahoma. And he said, I got home and told Evelyn what I'd done with our paycheck. He said, it's colder inside than it was outside. <laughs> she said, oh, you didn't do that. Yeah, he said, I did. Four o'clock in the morning, there was a man at the door. He said, and he was, he was a wealthy farmer, one of the biggest farmers in that whole part of the country. He said, Oral, I should have put this in the offering tonight. And he said, I'm ashamed of myself. I didn't put anything in there. But he said, now, this, he said, this is, this is not money. He said, I'm a farmer and I understand that if you're gonna if you're gonna reap a harvest, you're gonna have to sow a seed. He said, I had this money buried. I went home and dug it up. He said, Oral, I've got to have a miracle from God. He said, I've been playing around with the stock market, and he said, I'm about to lose my whole farm. And he said, This is seed, I'm telling you, for a miracle four $100 bills. He'd never seen a hundred dollar bill in his life. And he prayed with him. And that was when the revelation of seed time and harvest came to Oral Roberts. That started before the healing ministry. And actually, if you go back and look at it, seed time and harvest was what he was preaching when it came to healing because that was the revelation in his heart. That's the biggest thing about it. And that's what was ministered to me when he put his hands on me in 1966. And then in January of 67, I went to school at uh, ORU and I began to learn from him the laws of sowing and reaping. Amen. Amen. And from Brother Hagin, the laws of faith. Hallelujah. Well, <laughs> he said, I went back. He said, I went in that bedroom and he said, I fanned out those four $100 bills. And he said, Evelyn. <laughs> he said, God began to prosper them right then. 
He began to prosper them right there. They were driving down the street. Evelyn said, she screamed, stop the car. And he just slammed on the brakes and in the middle of the road and pulled off the side. He said, what is the matter? She said, Aura, get out. He got out of the car. <clears throat> when he got out on his side of the car, she laid her Bible up on top of the car. She said, read this. Third John 2. Beloved, I wish above all things, cross reference says pray. I pray above all things that you may prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. He said, I don't say that. She turned it around and shoved it across the top of the car to hell. He said, where has that been? <laughs> See, you read something, but with no revelation, you don't read it. Particularly if it says wish. He's, and that's when, it, that's when it struck the two of them with such strength and revelation seed time and harvest. It is God's will for every born again child of God to prosper and be in health even as their soul prosper. Amen. I don't preach myself happy. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Now for right now, let, let's turn. We'll take just a few minutes here. From Matthew chapter 12, turn to Matthew 12. We'll read down through some scriptures because if you're going to, if you're going to study anything about faith and we are, we're going to be talking about faith for finances, but you have to start here before you even talk about faith. Look at Matthew 12, uh, 36, but I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. For by your words shall you be justified and by your words you shall be condemned. Now, it is so vitally important that you realize that words are not primarily for communication. Words are primarily uh, the instruments of release of power. God created. In the beginning was the Word. The Word is with God. The Word was God. The same as in the beginning with God. Amen. So now, Let's look at Luke chapter six. And we'll just read through these. Let's look at the 45th verse. A good man out of the good treasure or deposit of his heart brings forth that which is good. And an evil man, now you need to study that out a bit this is not talking about a, a murderer, a killer, or something like that. No, no. The scripture calls an evil heart a heart of unbelief. Now, a heart of unbelief is a heart full of fear because all unbelief is fear-based and fear-dependent even though you know it's the word of God, even though you know it's true, but then every time you read it, you think, ah, oh, I can't believe that. Well, there are reasons for it. And, and as the Lord directs, maybe we'll get into some of those things. But now notice it says, out of the evil treasure of, the e -E of his heart bringeth forth. Notice the words, bringeth forth that which is evil. For of the abundance of, of the heart, his mouth speaks. Can you see the connection? Whatever is in your spirit in abundance is going to come out your mouth and whatever comes out your mouth yesterday is what you have today. 
I don't care what your intentions were. Well, <laughs> we'll see it as we go. And then of course, Mark eleven twenty three. 23, but I want you to put your eyes on that. 22nd verse, Jesus said, have faith in God or have the faith of God. For verily I say unto you, whosoever, this is all human beings, whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea, shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass. He shall have whatsoever he says. Now you notice that's written in red. Remember that. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Now then, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And let's look at the 13th verse. We having the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believed and therefore have I spoken we also believe and therefore we speak. Now Hebrews chapter three, verse one, wherefore holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle, the one God sent and high priest of our profession, Christ anointed Jesus. Now I want you to see something here. Don't just pass up the word Christ when you see it like that. You should take time to, to think about it and meditate it. This is very important in this scripture. I want you to notice this is the calling of Jesus as high priest after the order of Melchizedek. That's his calling. Now notice this. Partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the one God sent and high priest of our profession or our confession, the anointed Jesus. That is telling us that he is anointed to be the high priest over his word coming out our mouths. Mm, amen. That's right. We're not in this by ourselves. And the, the thing that the devil will throw at you, well, I just don't understand what me having something to say would have anything to do with it. It's not just you. That's right. yeah. That's right. Amen. It is not just you. He has been sent of God to be the high priest and he's anointed him to be the high priest or the administrator, the word is actually administration, administrator, of our confession. And then you go on over in the fourth chapter and it says very plainly, we have a high priest passed into the heavens, Jesus. Well, I want you to put your eyes on it. Turn on over there. Verse 14, 414. Seeing then that we have a great high priest, a great administrator that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession or our confession. Now that word translated profession or confession same word, both, both cases. Some places translate confession, others translated profession. It literally means to say the same thing. Yes. Now, what is an idle word? You're not going to find Jesus saying that tickles me to death. Uh-uh. Oh, that's, that's not only idle, that's stupid. Oh, I love God. Don't he thrill you to death? Mm. 
And that's, that's a pretty universal thing. It's in, it's, um, it's in several languages that I know of, but the, the devil has t taught us to speak death. It's the only way he can kill you to get you to say it. Well, I didn't mean it. He don't care whether you meant it or not. Jesus said it comes out of your mouth. That's what you're going to have. And he's a legalist. He'll whip you with a dictionary. Well, I didn't mean to, I didn't mean that. Well, don't say it, <laughs> darling. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Now then, you remember what Joel 3.10 said? Let the weak say, I am strong. No, I don't say let the, let the weak say, oh God, I'm so weak, I'm so weak. No, no, that's not what you desire. Jesus said, what's your everything you desire when you pray, believe you receive, then you shall have. You desire to continue to be weak? No, of course not. But as long as you keep saying that, you're just enforcing what's already there. Now this, this is basic fundamental uh, of, this is the very beginning of faith 101. I know everybody in here knows this, but we need to go back through yes. and rehearse these things and refresh our, our memory, refresh our spirit because this is spirit food. God created you spirit, soul, and body. Everything God ever created, he created to be fed and nourished. Every living thing has to have nourishment. I don't care if it's plants or bugs <laughs> or whatever it is. Everything has to have nourishment. That means that you, your spirit has to be nourished. <clears throat> your soul, which is made up of your mind, your will, and your emotions, needs soul food. And that ain't black eyed peas and cornbread. I, I'm <laughs> <laughs> Well, sometime I kind of help your soul. <laughs> Particularly when you come from West Texas, man. You know, but anyway, no, we're, we're talking about intellectual food, not intellectual candy. Your body can't live on candy. Your, your mind, your will, your emotions can't live on candy. You're going to have to go to the Word of God. Why? Because your spirit, uh, once it's fed, produces a strength called faith. Yes, yes. The mind, once it's fed properly and renewed to the word of God, begins to produce a strength. It's called will power. And then when your body is, is begin, begins to be fed according to what God said in his word, most people haven't learned this. Well, we're delivered from the law. Well, you, you hadn't been delivered from eating, have you? Yeah. Uh, God will tell you what to eat because see, let me, let me tell you something. Don't you understand Genesis is the first book of the Bible and s chapter six is not very far into it. <laughs> Amen. He said the days of man and he talked about, if you read it in the New Living, which is the best translation of that scripture, he said, my spirit will not put up with man living so long. And from this day forward, his normal lifespan will be 120 years. Normal, 120 years. And in that case, he said, no more than 120 years. But we haven't been strapped with the cap because we're born again. But now every verse you find in the Bible from there on, with long life, I'll satisfy him. That's based on 120 years. And uh, wisdom would add the length of your days. That's based on 120 years. By place before you life and death, choose life that you and your, your seed shall live. That's based on 120 years because that's, the, that's, that's where it lays on what he said. Now, all that he put in there, all of the foods that he says in his word were not created for you to eat. He created them for something else. That's based on a 120 year life for that body. And you start monkeying with it. <laughs> and it is just a simple fact that your body 
don't know what to do with it. I see that really yeah. went over there. <laughs> Thou shalt not find Twinkies in that list. <laughs> <laughs> now, look at, uh, oh, I, I started to tell you this. Once that system, spirit, soul, and body is functioning properly, that's an integrated system. And we have a prescription in the fourth chapter of the book of Proverbs that tells you exactly, exactly word for word, how to take that prescription on the Word of God and receive health. Mm -hmm. Well, the same thing will work in the area of finances, mm -hmm. where you're looking for you're looking at financial increased scriptures, the same as healing scriptures. That because that's that that is the prescription. That's like on the the spiritual prescription bottle. That's wrapped around the bottle. Well, it ain't gonna do you any good just to lay it there on the yeah. bed stand. I, I was having some, some serious stuff physically. I, and uh, <laughs> I said, Lord, uh, there's something going on here. What? I'm missing it here. Some, see, he can't miss it. it he's not, there's no way in the world that God is causing you to be sick, broke, tired, anything else. He doesn't have any sickness. There's no way he could put sickness on you. If he got sickness, if, if there's no sickness in heaven, there's no poverty in heaven. And that all of that's under the curse for him to put sickness on you. He'd have to steal it from somebody. And that'd be the devil. Mm -hmm. Well, he'll have the devil do it. I'm going to tell you something, sweetheart, about the devil. He is self-employed. He don't work for God. No. <laughs> I mean it. I mean it. And there's not anything that's come on you to teach you anything. The Word of God and the Holy Ghost, the greater one that lives within you, He's the teacher. Now, He'll take the opportunity to teach you once you stuck your finger in the fire. But He didn't put your finger in the fire. That's child abuse. And that's not Jesus. You want to know God's will when it comes to, to healing and prosperity? Look at Jesus in his earthly home. Well, Brother Copeland, I don't see prosperity in that. That's because you're poor. Your soul's not prospering. Let me ask you, what was Judas' job? He's treasure, right? Poor folks need a treasure. He was stealing out of the bag. There had to be something in there to steal. Let me ask you this. Was Jesus a tither? Yes. Yes. Well, of course he was. Yes. If he wasn't tithing, he'd been robbing God. Amen. Malachi 3.10. I mean, there's no way Jesus was not a tither. Amen. Well, what happens when you tithe? God said, prove me in this. I'll pour out blessing. You ain't got room enough to Amen. care for it. We have tithing rights. Oh. I, this is the reason there's such a fuss over tithing. There's been a fuss over tithing since the Garden of Eden. That's what got Cain in trouble. Not only that, that's what got Adam in trouble. That was God's tree. He ate God's fruit. Now you think God put the tree out there just to look at? No, there's good fruit on that tree. What does he do with your tithe? He spends it on you. On your spiritual development. On, amen. That's where the tithe goes. There would have come a time if Adam and his wife had let that alone there would have come a time when that fruit was ripe that God would have said, all right, bring me fruit off my tree. Amen. 
and he would have said, and the only reason you can tell this is because you take his, his way of doing things all the rest of the rest of the scripture. He never changes. He would have called them in there and he said, he would have said, now I'm going to teach you the difference between good and evil and right and wrong. I'm going to teach you what is called sin. And I'm going to teach you about the devil and I'm going to teach you. It would have come with the tithe. Elsewhere, how would he have known how to teach Cain and Abel? Where else would they have gotten it? They had to get it from a daddy, right? Now that shows you what they did and what the scripture says about what Cain and Abel did. That shows you, that shows you what Abel already knew he should have done. Well, I didn't come here to preach that this morning, but I'm sure glad I did. Glory to God. We have tithing rights. One of those is, I will rebuke the devourer for your sake. Mark Barkley's granddaughter was in the swimming pool and she got her hair caught in, she wasn't but nine, she got her hair caught in the, in the, the drain suction and pulled her little head up there and, and she couldn't get loose and she drowned. And they finally, her, her daddy finally jumped in there and, and pulled her loose from that thing and brought her up there and laid her down. They called the paramedics and they rushed out there. And the paramedic was, had been working with her and he looked up, he said later, he looked up at her mother to shake his head, no. And about that time, Whoa, her daddy, Mark Barkley's son-in-law, shouted, this is another one of those times, one of those anointed shouts. And he said, I claim my tithing rights. I am a tither and the destroyer is rebuked for my sake in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And Raise that little girl up. No brain damage, no nothing. And the prayer medic said, well, well uh, I'm, would, would, would y'all go, would you submit to going to the hospital with me for, an, for examination? He said, I've already called this in. They said, yeah. And so they drove over to the hospital and the whole emergency team was out there, you know, ready. And they opened up the back door of the ambulance and she stepped out and her daddy stepped out with her. And, and, and of course, the, 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 uh, the PM stepped out and the doctor said, where's the victim? And, and he went. He said, you? She said, yes, you drowned. Yes, but Jesus raised me from the dead. <laughs> you see where we've missed it? Well, the devil trying to tell us, well, there ain't no use to tithe. I mean, it all belongs to God anyway. Well, I, I wouldn't care if it did. I'd do it anyway for just the absolute honor of doing it. That's right. Yes, yes, yes. Well, <laughs> we're going to talk some more about that. I can see. But we have tithing rights. <laughs> Proverbs 4, 24, put away from you a disobedient mouth. Make that mouth do what it's supposed to do. You make that mouth do its duty. I want you to know, well, go to the 18th chapter of Proverbs. See, the original plan was for Adam to use the faith and power of God, which in 
which is called the blessing of the Lord. The blessing of the Lord is the power of God known as faith and includes the other manifestations of spiritual power known as the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, goodness, meekness, kindness, temperance. Against such there is no law. There ain't nothing the devil's got that can stop those forces when they're mixed with the love of God and faith. There is no power on this earth like the power of the love of God. Amen. Amen. So look at this. This was the original plan. Verse 20, a man's belly shall be satisfied with the fruit of his mouth. Now notice this. And with the increase of his lips shall he be filled all prosperity, all the anointing of increase. The anointing of increase was on Jesus when he took the loaves and the fishes. Come on. You remember faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Mark 6, 34. And Jesus saw them as sheep without a shepherd and he taught them many things things. So faith came. Faith came. They were believing God. They weren't just a bunch of dead, hungry spectators. They were believing God. He taught them many things. But then what did he do? He took the fish and the, and the bread and held it up and he blessed it. What do you think he said? Well, Father, bless this little fish and bless his little biscuits and bless the fisherman that caught the fish and the baker man that baked the biscuits and bless it to the nourishments of our bodies. Hallelujah, hallelujah, amen. I don't think so. What is the blessing? What did God say to, to Adam? Be fruitful. Multiply. Hallelujah. Yes. What else did he say? Replenish. Replenish. He wasn't talking about babies. No. <laughs> there weren't any babies. You don't replenish something that ain't there. <laughs> replenish the earth. That word the translated replenish, it means the same thing in English. It means to consistently resupply. You go to the cabinet, go to the refrigerator, and it's empty. What do you do? You resupply it. You got to go get more supplies. You replenish. That's the word people use. You need to replenish that, that, that stock closet over there. It, it, it's nearly empty. Amen. Amen. He's telling them to replenish the earth. Well, right now, the, the eighth chapter of Romans says the whole creation is groaning and travailing for what? For a manifestation of the sons of God because the sons of God have the blessing of Abraham living on the inside of them. We're the answer to this thing and we've been walking around saying, I'm just scared to death. Oh. Ain't no way the blessing can have any power. You want your words to have power? You want your words when you lay hands on your children, when you lay hands on somebody at church, in your ministry, you lay hands on somebody, you want to see that power come up, but then if somebody drives out in front of you on the freeway, hey, well, I hope you have a nice day, you dummy. <laughs> there ain't no way God's going to leave the power turned up in you. At the least, you'd have blown his tires out. You have to prepare for these things. You have to realize how much power is residing on the inside of you. Darling, I'm going to tell you something. That's the faith of God in you. Yeah. 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 Hallelujah. Well, here's, a, here's, another, here's another part of that. Uh, Brother Copeland and I, you know, well, I'm telling you what, if, 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 we, if we don't have 
if we don't have two hundred fifty thousand dollars in our in our in our church, we're gonna lose our building. And we, we, and, and we got to have it in a couple of weeks. And you know, I just don't have that kind of faith. Well, what 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 you got in mind? I don't know. I, I you know, I. Uh, you know, I, I know faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God, but, but and I've been spending time in the world, but I, I, I'm just going to have to, I, I, I might have to have more faith in that. Really? Are you born again? Oh yeah. Baptized in the Holy Ghost? Oh, Gromo Steady? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Sweetheart, you've already, you've already received the most outstanding, the most powerful miracle known to the human race which was the total recreation of your spirit being. Flesh is easy. Spirit is hard. The Lord asked me one time, he said, what, what in your estimation, what is the most, uh, most outstanding release of my power? I said, well, when you created the heaven and the earth, no, no. No, he said that was easy. That's easy? Yeah. He said, when I said light be, he said, there wasn't anybody against me. He said, no. When I had Jesus born again in the pit of hell, and he had been made sin and every devil in hell, all the unbelievers, even my own people in the ministry were against me in this. He said, all of hell was against me, but he said, when I raised him from the dead was the most powerful miracle that had ever happened in this universe. And you got the same thing, not one ounce less. No, no, no. When you made Jesus Lord of your life, you were born again, not of incorruptible, but not of corruptible, but incorruptible seed by the word of God, which lives, which abides forever. And you're telling me you don't have enough faith for a measly $200,000? Come on. That's God's faith. That's the same faith that created all of this. That's the same faith that raised you up out of hell itself. Salvation faith, healing faith, prosperity faith, all the same faith. Glory to God. You don't need any more faith. Start feeding it. Get busy where your mouth is concerned. Get that disobedience idol speaking out of your mouth and out of your heart. Start feeding on it. Hallelujah. Oh my goodness. Don't look, don't look at your watch. I'm not. <laughs> Hallelujah. Verse 21. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Now, what does he mean? They that love it. Wherever you put your eyes, the Lord said to me when I asked him, I said, Lord, what, what, what's wrong here? I, I'm, I, I've missed it somewhere. These symptoms are just nagging at me. What, what's going on here? And he took me back over there to Proverbs 4. My son, attend to my words. I said, well, yeah, that means put the word first place. That, yeah, that, uh-huh. Let's, let's look at that because that's a prescription. We'll, we'll just use this scripture to close with. And we'll come back to this at a later time before the weekend's over, I'm sure. Proverbs 4.20, my son attend to my words. Now look, incline thine ear unto my saying. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Yeah. You're, you're listening to too much other stuff. 
You're watching the news and they're telling you how bad the economy is. Well, I mean, look at that government debt. Dear Lord, we're going down the drain. I don't know who to vote for. I don't know what to do. I tell you, I just won't vote. That's the stupidest decision you ever made. You need to be praying to seek God and find out for whom you're supposed to vote and do some, spend some time at this. And it's not just the president and vice president. It's every office in the land. And I'll tell you something, local judges affect your, affect your life more than the president does. Amen. Well, I'll just, I just won't vote. Yeah, you just did. When the righteous rule, the people rejoice. When the wicked rule, the people mourn. When the church is silent, the wicked keep electing the wicked and the people continue to suffer. That's what's got this thing in the mess that it's in right now. Now, I'm not going to tell you to vote for it. I don't endorse it. I can tell you pretty quick who I'm not going to vote for. <laughs> I can tell you this. Go read the party platform. Forget about what your grandma told you. She's not the Holy Ghost. Go read those party platforms. I'm not voting for anybody that's pro-abortion pro same sex marriage. I'm not going there because guilt by association came out of the Bible. Now, what, what, are, what do they call that? If you're, you're driving the car and you, you, uh, you, you stop and the guy goes in and robs a 7-Eleven store and he comes back out and you say, what did you do? Get out of here quick. No, you're an accomplice. You're just as guilty as he is. You're guilty by association. That's Bible, folks. And you, you voting for somebody that's pushing abortion? Somebody that's, that's pushing uh, assisting suicide? Well, Brother Copeland, they, you know, it's impossible for them to get better. No, 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 no. no. Tell that little woman that that had about three days to live when she spit that tumor up. Doctor, uh, Brother Hagen has affidavits from three doctors that said it's totally impossible for him to live uh, another few days. And he made the statement to his mother. He said, it's a shame we can't just give that boy a shot and let him go on. He said, he's, he's suffering, he's paralyzed and, and he'll never get any better. But it wasn't but a few days he walked out of there and lived to be 86 years old preaching the gospel all over the world. So don't come at me with that and I'm certainly not going to vote it into office. And when you vote for somebody like that, particularly if you're doing it on account of money or if you're doing it on account of some money your kin folks told you to, or if you don't vote, you just voted for that. And God will hold you responsible because you didn't do anything about it. You're an accomplice to mass murder. And there's a curse, judgment being expressed on the government of this nation right now. No, it, it's not judgment against the United States. It's a, it's a judgment against, see the judgment right now, don't, don't get judgment confused. There's only one time when God personally exercises judgment and that's when it's final. Right now, judgment, and it's, it's working right now. It hit us in 9-11. It hit us seven years later, which is another Shemitah year. It hit us in 2008. Well, here we are in the Jubilee Shemitah year and it's going to hit before the end of this year. I'm, I'm looking towards midsummer, somewhere along in there. I hadn't had the Lord talk to me about it. But every time I bring it up, he didn't say no either. Come on. 
And sometimes I go by what he don't say as much as I do about what he does. But you can take, you can look at the track record. We're in for some financial trouble. And I'm telling you this, I'm, I'm telling you this as a minister of the gospel, I'm telling you this as your partner, get on your faith and get prepared for it. Because it, it, it's not, we're in the kingdom of God, That's folks. Right. Amen. Amen. The Lord said to me in 2009, he said, this is not the end of the United States. It is the end of the Babylonian socialistic system that's been attacking this nation for 110 years. Well, it's 117 years now. It's the end of that. It's the end of socialism in this country. Do you ever think we'd see the day an, a, a, a socialist would be running no. and not get run out on a rail? Yeah. Well, socialists have been in it a long time. They just, just didn't call themselves that. They call themselves progressives. Yes, sir. But it's progressive socialism. Yes. That's socialism that creeps up on you a little at a time. Yes. Because they knew the American people wouldn't accept it, but it took over a hundred years for people to, they didn't even know what it was anymore. And you ask most people today what socialism is and they can't tell you. That's right. That's right. That's right. I wonder how many of you could, particularly in the light of the Bible. Amen. Socialism is man trying to meet his own needs without God. It began in the Garden of Eden when Adam sewed him a fig leaf suit. <laughs> God must have laughed. If, I mean, if, if it hadn't been so sad, he never sewed anything in his life. If he had, he wouldn't have picked fig leaves. <laughs> well, that must have been hilarious. But then God killed an animal, yes. made covenant with him and made him of, made the two of them fur garments. God made them. Yes. <sighs> you know, that's a good looking suit. <laughs> but now to them it's ugly because they had been clothed in the glory. Yes. You couldn't even see their bodies no. until after they committed treason before yes. God yes. and the inner light went out. They were separated from the glory. Yeah. That's what it meant when they saw they were naked. That body was ugly to them because they'd been a fire from the loins up and a fire from the loins down like God. And I don't run over my time again this morning. How'd you get anything out of this this morning? Hallelujah! Come on, stand up and let's give God the glory. Hallelujah! 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 Oh, hallelujah. Come on up, kid. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. Shunde gre in daria da krekishi patala. Uh huh. I talked about the mighty wave that's just offshore. And that as it comes in, you're seeing it now, but it'll increase and increase. And it first looks like a tidal wave, but then you'll realize it's a tsunami of the power of the Spirit of God. It is a tsunami of the glory that's crashing in to the shores of this nation. But, there is judgment that's functioning and that judgment is seed time and harvest. When I told you and when I told others certain things would take place if you did this or if you did that, and you continue to do this, I give you a lot of time to repent. And back when this nation honored me, and back when this nation 
cared for my word. And back when this nation was spreading the word of God all over the world, which is its primary calling, back in those days, as in days of old, I protected. My protecting hand was there. But the more you invited me out of the schools, the more you invited me to leave the Supreme Court, the more you invited me to go look the other way, there comes a time when seed time and harvest comes into play. And I had no way to stop it. However, those of you that have turned from your wicked way. Those of you that have humbled yourself before me. Those of you that live and walk by faith. You never have to change your lifestyle because of the time, because you're walking the same by faith day in and day out, good times and bad. And when these kind of things begin to, to, to happen and you begin to see that that there is also not just a, a, a tsunami of the glory coming, but there has also been a sin flood. Amen. But for those who will seek first the kingdom of God, who will seek my way of doing things, who will look unto me, as your source, who will learn that your giving and your sowing is more powerful than all of the earth's economy. And if you begin to put my word in your heart, my word in your mind, my word in your mouth, you begin to sow it into your own ears. You begin to talk it, think it, live it, eat and sleep it. I said, you will not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of my mouth. And when you feed my word into your spirit, faith cometh, faith cometh, faith cometh, and faith will arise. Faith will come up. And when faith comes up, glory be to God, it is a mighty force. Hallelujah. Faith cometh. And when faith arises and faith comes, it'll drill down, it'll drill down and drill down. It'll drill down through all the fear. It'll drill down through all the unbelief. It'll drill down through all your debts. It'll drill down for all of the lack and the lack of supply. It'll drill down through the devil's operation and all the sickness and disease and explode into healing and explode into life and explode into health. And it'll seem like you're somebody from another life and somebody from another world. And you'll begin to prosper because you have begun to say, I insist on keeping the New Testament love commandment. I insist on keeping this command, sir. I am yours to command, Lord Jesus. I'm a soldier in the army of the Lord. Hallelujah. I'm a man, I'm a woman of faith. Amen. I insist on myself living by faith. I insist on my mouth being obedient to the things of God. And those that will listen to me and those that will follow me and those that will walk in these days and stand on my word and realize I am your source. I am your only source. There are a lot of different avenues and channels, but I am your source, saith the Lord Jesus. And saith the greater one that lives on the inside of you. If you will look to me, I will increase you. If you will look to me and get rid of being covetous, get rid of being afraid, get rid of all of these different things, I'll raise you up. I'll deliver you from poverty for it's under the curse and I was made to be the curse so you could be the blessing of Abraham. And in that day, in that day of trouble, in that day, for the faithful, for the committed, oh, yeah. 
everything gonna be all right. Say it. Everything gonna be all right. Say it again. Say it three times. Everything's gonna be all right. Everything's gonna be all right. Everything's gonna be all right. I'll see you at two o'clock. Hey, Papa. Hold on. Hey, Papa. I wanted to remind you of something. The first time you ever told me about the glory tsunami, we were sitting on your back porch and you brought that to my attention, the power of it. But what you said is, it's not the crash that's the most powerful part. It's the part where it drags it all back into the ocean and it doesn't come back on land. Amen. And we're being dragged Amen. into that glory and we're never going to step out of it. Oh, that tsunami good, will Lord. drag us back into that glory that's and good, we Lord. stay in that ocean. The power of the tsunami mm -hmm. is when we don't come back to the Amen. land. Just wanted to. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Woo, glory to God.